Uh, we have um, Michael Lindsay and uh, Mark Robbins preparing for us today. And they are going to argue and uh, explain to us why their method is better than the other guys. And then various people are going to come up and do cameos. Uh, Jonas has agreed to um, salt a raven for us and show us how to uh, ship it home. And uh, basically, we've got lots of other exciting things, a bird pickle, and uh, Stella's going to do wire decoy mounts for Miss Lily. And I'll be doing spread wings. Anyway, thank so you. So don't hesitate to ask questions during any of this. One of the very first things we're going to point out is don't use ballpoint pen. Always use a permanent ink, a pen. And you can see that we, in these field uh, catalog pages, we have already listed out lots of the data that we want to collect. This is a reminder, sorry, <laughs> to, to prompt a prepper what data he should be collecting or she. And because a lot of times we're preparing as many as six or seven individuals back to back to back, and you don't want to have to remember anything so you'll, you'll mess up the data. So as we go along with this, we write things down as we go along. So Chris, jump in at any yeah, point. Yeah, so this, this paper, we kind of mentioned the quality of the paper as well. That, that we just took a little bit of water and, and rubbed my finger on this paper, and you can see the paper already starting to come apart. Uh, so we'll, that's, that's another reason to use that high quality. The high quality, like a Sharpie permanent ink pen. Permanent ink or one of these little uh, micron guys. So critical to do. So just talking about some of the things we did earlier, if this bird had just been shot or hit by a car, and we want to maximize the data, we take photographs of those soft bar colors. We, and, or we would at least note the soft bar colors. Now this bird's been in the freezer, so those weren't recorded, but we'd note bill color, iris, if it had an eye ring, the, the tarsus coloration. And then the next thing we do, well, the first thing we do, so it doesn't, uh, if it's been hit by a car, it might be bleeding, we'll put cotton in the mouth so that it won't bleed all over the plumage and save you a lot of work later on and when you put this bird together. Yeah, so the these data sheets have, uh, this is one whole sheet for one specimen, which is uh, quite a lot of data on there. So they have a spot for uh, wingspan, wing cord, total body length, all those sorts of measurements. A lot of people uh, do like to take those before so that you can compare afterwards, after specimens dried, how those measurements might have changed. Because um, we know shrink. They do shrink. They do shrink in the specimen versus so, um, so we don't. We actually don't typically do that as part of our, our normal prep routine, but it's not a bad idea. And then well, one of the reasons we're doing it is we have an awful lot of students preparing, and um, just as reminders. And uh, I'm looking forward to having enough budget to have decent paper. For that. <laughs> okay. Often, one of the things we do before we make that initial uh, incision is look at molt. And we'll spread the wing and see if there's any indication of molt. And I can tell you from right here that this bird does not show any. Here are the primaries, and we know the secondaries are attached to a bone here called the ulna. And I see no indication of molt. And I also see no indication of ectoparasites having chewed on these feathers. So we might even note those data that, okay, no wing molt, also spread the tail. Oftentimes you need to look at the base and see if there's any uh, follicles, but I can tell you from just the shape of these, it's, it's not a mold. So we're going to put it in on this piece of paper that there's no wing and tail mold, and I'm going to blow on this bird to check for body mold. I'll try to find some here, Chris, if you see them. Oftentimes it's actually it's easier to do that later once you've skinned the bird out. You can see it from the inside. You can find body mold, especially on something like a duck that has really really thick feathers, um, and I've not seen any of this bird either. So what we do, is, as we go along, it's critical you record these data as you go along because it's easy to make mistakes, particularly if you're preparing a number of specimens back to back. So I'm going to put no wing or tail mold and no body mold. Now I may, as Chris pointed out, as I get through this, I may find some, as I invert this bird, that there might be some mold. We note the location and whether, the, how, the, how extensive it is, whether it's, it's light, moderate, or heavy. And hopefully we'll have some specimens today that will show some kind of body mold, yeah. some kind of mold. So Chris, do you want to start or you want to? 
Yeah, we're ready to start scanning. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah, sure. Jump in. We have an asymmetrical mold. Would you record that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Like if, for example, okay, this is a, let's see, this is 10 primary bird. Let's say this bird, this, here's the outermost, you count from the outermost inward. So this would be number 10. Let's say 9 was in molt, you would say uh, P9 in molt, and if it was only one side, we'd note that. P9 on left side of the bird. The more information you get down, the more the, the, the more information that will help with all kinds of studies, whether you're looking at molt or extra like parasites. Like, uh, a hot to pull out one of the yeah, it is, it, whether it's molt or missing right. feather, you know, is, is sometimes hard. Yeah, that's worth recording. Yeah, it's worth recording. When we've met a lot of birds, a lot of times the birds will lose feathers in the bag or being pulled in that we'll note that loss in the bag or the loss in the I have two examples of what you're talking about. Uh, Greaves eat their flight feathers as an aid to digestion, so those feathers are in blood. And then we have... Um, See these dark feathers right here? Those are all molting feathers, so there's all through there. Is that showing up on the screen? Yeah. And here's down the center. These are a little more prominent than the other white. You can see these real dark feathers. That bird's in mold. Okay, so in this affiliated woodpecker, I think it's more a case of road rash. It's missing half its tail. Yeah, yeah exactly. We're. Whew. Okay, there's a scent. We know these two right here. Oh, I'll get this out like that. Those are central rectus. These are right here. I'll hold these up so you can see those. So we've, we've got several that are missing, and it may not be due to mold at all. Maybe just because it got hammered by a car. Okay. By the way, this is an ivory bill. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take the like photo. Like you know. <laughs> <laughs> So we're we doing we're not doing partial skeleton on any of these are we? Um to them later. Okay. Okay. So when when I'm getting ready to start a skin, I, I, that's the first question I always ask is, you know, what am I gonna do with this bird? Uh, because if I'm just doing a uh, if I'm gonna start saving partial skeleton, obviously I don't want to break any bones. Uh, but if I'm just doing a regular skin, uh, I actually like to break the humeri first. And so I usually on birds this size, I usually kinda just lay it over the side of the table and Give it a little whack. That's why I don't sit next to you. There it goes, sorry. Like that. Now I have both, both humor I broke, and it makes it a little easier to work on. The wings aren't in the way so much. I have a question. Yeah. How would you do that on a larger bird? Get it harder. <laughs> So what I'm going to do on this California quail is make an incision right down. Uh, this is kind of a, a modification of the classic method. Chris, are you doing the classic method and I'm doing an LSU type of method? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to cut from the base of the furculens. That's hard to, to see on this bird because the density of feathers is so great. I'm going to make an incision with my scalper do this with a pair of scissors, kind of right down the center of the breast. And then I'm going to use my fingers to pull the skin off to the side. And normally at this point, aha, okay, here's a good lesson. See all these weird round balls? That's the crop that's filled with seed. This bird was doing well before whatever happened to it. It's unclear what happened to this bird. Was it hit by a car? Um, I think you've got the uh, big panties hit the window. Hmm. Okay. So this bird may have been at a bird feeder, and its crop yeah. is packed with seeds and so I tend to like to use white cornmeal because of the fine dust that Chris is using will get in your nasal passages <laughs> and it's hard to breathe so I the white we, reason we use white cornmeal versus yellow yellow has more fat in it we want to use it less fat if possible so this is ground up corn cob what I have here so uh, we have a whole selection of different kinds of materials but this is a uh, this is what's called number six ground corn cob, uh, and it's used for uh, cleaning up, you know, 
um, oil spills or anything like that, and you kind of had you have a, a fluid spill, they use this stuff just to clean up all the fluid, and it works great for skin of birds. It comes in different uh, grains, coarseness. Uh, we, in our tumbler, we use a, 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 a heavier grain, number six. It's basically like this stuff here. If we were had a tumbler where we were dealing with fatty birds, we might use that kind of stuff. But uh, but I like to use this number six. <laughs> now I'm going to put in a Canadian note. The wonderful uh, white cornmeal that uh, uh, Mark is using is really hard to get in Canada. I swallowed this in. I, it wasn't my form that I checked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so um, a substitute here in Canada is to use potato flour, which mm -hmm. works very well. Mm -hmm. okay. So this represents kind of a unique situation. Have, look how packed, okay, is that showing up up there? Oh, the crop, this solid seeds. And what I'm going to try to do is remove that without ripping it open so it doesn't get all over the feathers. Normally I would, so you guys can see this, I'm not going to add all this cornmeal in here. Normally at this point I would be covering this thing with cornmeal to ensure that the feathers don't get soiled in case I do break open the, the crop. So I'm just going to pull this out and then... The hard part about doing this you know, is we're trying to show you how to do this, but normally uh, if you can see what you're doing, you don't have enough so here's the crop. Look what I'm going to do. I'm going to open this up and you can see this bird was doing quite well. <laughs> One thing I would mention there, like sometimes when you do get a bird, like, you know, Aaron's got a fish in it or something, it's like weigh the fish up, whereas the duck that put the weight because... Right, exactly. Very good point, Paul. Thanks. In fact, if anybody has any comments, there's a, we've got some real heavy hitters sitting out here. Jump in at any point in case we miss something. And a lot of times we'll go ahead and measure, the, uh, like if it's a fish, we'll describe the fish or insect and put those measurements on that prey. On this case, we'll, I'm not sure what kind of seeds these are. Is this? It's like bird feeder. Bird feeder. Big bird feeder. <laughs> so at this point, because I've got kind of a mess because of that crop, I'm going to just shower this with a little bit of cornmeal. And what I want to do is sever that neck. So I'm going to go in and cut the bird with Chris jump in if you need to. Well, yeah, as soon as you cut that, I'm going to switch and show the other half of your own. Okay. So I'm being very careful because I don't notice how I'm, I'm cutting sideways, not down, because I don't want to cut the skin like I just did. <laughs> also, we've got quite a bit of fat on this bird. I'll, I'll note that on the tag as well. So Chris, I've gone ahead and severed that. Go so we, Mark mentioned there's two different styles here um, of, of skinning out a bird, the, the LSU style and what we call the traditional method. Uh, the traditional method is, is going from uh, the sternum down to the cloaca and starting with the uh, legs and the tail rather than starting up uh, near the crop. So, uh, so that incision, you just find, find the keel, go a little bit up from, from the gut and just make an incision going. I like to use uh, scalpel as well. Some people use scissors. Okay. That should be about good right there. Okay. And then with this method, then you just start working your way around. Uh, the important thing here when you're when you're skinning is. Uh, Bird skin can be fragile, so you want to um, hold on to the skin and, and, and work the, the muscle away from the skin and not pull on the skin so much. Uh, you end up with a big hole in the skin. This bird is, um, for a duck, not very fat, thankfully. And ducks tend to have very thin skin. Chris, Mark, can you tell uh, the, the differences in the two prep styles? Are those, you know, in your opinion, are those just personal style differences? Are there pros and cons to sort of starting with the neck and the wings versus the legs first? Very good, very good point. Thanks, Ben. What I, the reason the, I modified my method, I learned the traditional way, and I got to LSU and I got retrained <laughs> real quick. Um, I cut from the, you know, base up to the furcula down to where the sternum meets the intestinal 
cavity. And the reason I don't cut into that intestinal cavity, if you cut too deep, you have all those uh, gastric juices flowing out and getting on your feathers. So I tend, when we made an initial decision, just cutting the skin, going from the neck down to the base of the sternum. And, by, and I can be real sloppy. I can cut deep into that and all I have is muscle and I don't have all, you know, all these fluids coming out onto the feathers. So thanks for pointing that out. Some of us prefer precision. Oh, is that, is that what it is? <laughs> I like sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, would, I would add to that is I learned with the traditional and then when I went to Kansas with Mark, I learned the LSU method and I found that and when I teach, I find this is true. I feel it's easier to learn. If you've never skinned a bird before, it's easier to learn the LSU because of that safety net of you can cut deep into the muscle and not risk getting into the gut content. And, and there's a, the, the traditional method is a lot more blind because you can't exactly see what's going on in the legs. You can't see under the fibrocyte. But then I've also found that I think my skin's come out consistently better so what I've been doing with my students is introduce them with one and graduate them to the other and then let them choose. Mm -hmm. they, your specimens will come out differently. They have different right. stresses right. at different points. For sure. <clears throat> so what I just did there, I think that was up on the screen, I uh, found, found my leg and, and, and broke that leg and, and just punctured, you know, using the sharp point of that broken leg, I just pushed that up. Using hold, grabbing onto the foot and pushing right up, and now I have an exposed uh, leg bone there, with, with and it sort of strips the meat itself. Which, when if you do it that way and just push it right up. So is that leg bone connected to the hip bone? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> into the ankle bone. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to sever the wings. Because what we're think about what we're trying to do here, we're set, we have sever the neck. We want to sever those wings, and what we're trying to do is, like a glove, reverse this bird so we can get that body out of there. So I've just cut one wing, I'm going to go to the other side and cut the other, and I'm fighting, a, this bird is very fat. So I've got to be careful of ensuring that the feathers don't get soiled by all this fat. So I'll be constantly throwing cornmeal on here. Okay, now I've got the other wing <coughs> exposed, an incision. Okay, now both wings have been severed from the main body, and because this thing's so fat, I'm gonna add a bunch of cornmeal in here, and I'll try to show you here in a second what this looks like after I've got a little cornmeal in here. Now, one of the, the more difficult things to do on a bird is when you're working down the lower back, a lot of birds have very thin backs, and if you're not careful, as you move, you're using the thumb of your finger, moving that skin down from the, the lower back, that will often rip. Things like car uh, cardinals, American robins, it's really thin. And I must say, I've not done this species before, so I'm being a little careful. As you can see, I'm just gradually working that down. This is the back here, the fatty back. <clears throat> I thought, I thought your bird was going to be fatty than mine. How did you end up like this? Yeah, well, I got the, the problem with having a non fat duck is that the skin sometimes really decides to attach itself to the body, so you got to work with it a little harder. But, um, that brings up a great point, which is that there's a lot of variation among different taxa and how easier to put their skin. Trogans will have feathers fall off and smoke them. Um, wet, wet toilet paper <laughs> was like, seriously. It's a nice picture, it has good, strong, thick skin. You can't mess them up too much. Starlings are perfect. Um, pigeons have a nice, thick layer of fat on its freaking skin that is usually sewn to the body with strong connective tissue. So those are one of the most challenging. Uh, in the PowerPoint on uh, skinning your first bird, what the slide says there's more um, uh, agreement on what your first bird should not be than what it should be. And a fat bird and a thin skinned bird are definitely starlings, cowbirds, are highly recommended for first birds. Uh, also, um, a lot of the hawks are different. <coughs> Has anyone ever done the research on the thickness of skin, why that varies? Like, 
why trojans are possibly there? That's a very good question. Gary, do you have any insight on why trojans? <laughs> <laughs> So um, what I did was we were we were talking here. I removed one wing, so I'm down. Excuse me, one leg. So I'm down to removing the other leg. So we're getting to the point where we've almost separated the body from the skin. I'm going to cut that leg, and now I'm going to slowly work this down to where you expose the uropygial gland. This is the oil gland. You can see that they're really prominent on this species. I'll get that cleared off. That's the uropygial gland right there. It's usually not quite that prominent in a bird uh, this size. And now, this takes a little experience of knowing where to cut. If the feathers, the tail feathers of this bird are right there, and they're coming in and they're attached right here. So if I cut on this side of the uropygial, I'm going to lose all the tail feathers. So I want to make sure that I cut on the body side of where those tail feathers are anchored. And I'm going to have gravity help me here a little bit in ensuring that I don't have a lot of body fluid flying out. I'm just gradually going along there, snipping that, and I'm left with the uropygial gland there, and we definitely want to clean that. So I'm going to, sorry. Is this by the LSU method having it's so much easier to do the tail that way than the traditional way. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. When you're sort of going blindly underneath. Right. So I've just chopped out the ear pigeon and I'm going to scrape that. And we're going to come back to this later. So right now I'm just going to put some cornmeal in there and help absorb all this fat. Then I'm going to turn that tail inside out for right now. I'm just going to set this aside. So at this point, we want to collect tissue. We've got the body out of it. And hopefully this is you know real fresh bird we're working with. Let's get those uh, tissues in liquid nitrogen, or if we're here in an uh, institution like this, get it in the freezer. And what we typically do, we'll take a snippet of, of breast. Or do we want to eat this? Do we want to eat corn. this? <laughs> <laughs> it's looking pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But real quick before we do go that, doing this other method, uh, you know, we do the legs and then the tail before we take the body out. And so one of the things I do is check for a bursa uh, while I have it exposed here. And so what uh, what I've done is just kind of moving this aside, looking around to see if there might be a bursa in there anywhere. I'm not, I'm not seeing any specifically fleshiness there. But so, uh, so bursa versus skull vacation. Let's re remind you. After about four months, passerines you have, it takes for that second layer of calcium to be able to deposit a cream. We'll talk about this in a few minutes when we get, well, I guess we don't have a passerine out here to look at. The passerines completely ossify that second layer of calcium after about four months. So that aging character is only good for a short amount of time in passerines. The thing that Chris just mentioned on the bursa, Fabricius is often there for up to two years in uh, some birds, like shorebirds. It goes from an organelle that kind of looks like a uh, oblong testes when it's large and fresh to in the shorebirds in the second year, they, it becomes black, more retracted, and looks heart-shaped. And these are things you learn as you work through this. So that bursa, the presence of bursa, tells you much longer period of time of whether a bird is young or not. So it's, it's one of these things that Actually, Chris, we've only been looking for bursa probably for 20-some like years. Yeah, yeah, about 20. Ornithologists didn't get onto that for a long time. Mary, maybe, Gary, you were on it long before we were up here. Mm -hmm. but, a lot of that came from the poultry industry. You know. Right, right, from studying at chickens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you want to mention why it's important to get rid of the uh, your video plant? Like, why is that so important to make sure they get all that out? Yeah, because you'll have grease. Uh, it'll just sit there and just continue to off gas, if you will. <laughs> so this is a really tough duck skin here. It's finally coming off now. But um, now that I've separated the, the tail from the rest of the body, I can start trying to get my bird's body out. You know it's the LSU method. It is a lot faster getting the body out. Yeah, I, I was trying to give Mark 
So right now... Uh, also, one thing maybe we can talk about is, for instance, um, you do end up with dehydrated birds. And uh, sometimes um, we use uh, a hypodermic needle to add some water. Do you want to discuss that? Of the or yeah, we do that occasionally. You got a freeze dried bird, and and you, and you you want to try to do something about it before you start skinning, uh, and you just take a little bit of water in a syringe and then start injecting it around the eyes and around the head, especially places that tend to dry out quickly. Uh, birds that are been in the freezer for more than a year or so, uh, the head, the you know um, around the, the wings, especially. Uh, any of the appendages, you know, the legs, wings, and uh, sometimes we inject water in there. Or you can just, you know, a lot of the birds that, you know, we end up washing anyway, sometimes we'll just dump them in soapy water and let them soak, soak in soapy water before we even start skinning. Yeah, I've done this, but uh, you yeah. know, you're going to put them in water before. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Wow. Yeah. So, besides taking tissue right away after we got this body up, we're going to sex this bird because oftentimes the gonads will disappear in here real quick, especially if it's a young bird, a fall bird. So this is this quail, and interestingly, I can't find one of the testes. I'm not sure if it's something that's happened to it, maybe when it collided with a window. But this right here is that dark. I'm not sure where it went. I think it just exploded. So here's this black thing right here. I'm going to outline it is a dark testes, and we'll note the color of that because. On things like Catharus thrushes, um, a great cheek thrush, uh, wood thrush, um, Swainson's thrush, they have dark testes, um, whereas other genera of birds, maybe just this uh, tan colored. So we've got this left testes, I'm going to measure that. And what's often confusing to beginners, it, there's a, your, uh, excuse me, adrenal gland underneath there, and in fact it almost has the same shape here. See that orange thing I'm pointing to? It almost has a testy shape there. But I know that that's what's sitting underneath these dark testes. And so we've only got one testes, even that's it's kind of confusing there. So I'm going to measure that. I don't, I don't, I don't care. Okay, you can do that. You have something? Okay. Maybe actually. Uh, they're, they're just, it must be that's perfect. So um, I've got this body skinned out pretty well. I've, I've already done one wing. I was just going to show you real quick. The other one, you know, having broken that wing in advance, it makes it a lot easier to sort of peel that body back. And, uh, and once you get to that point, you just got to be careful that bird bones are sharp when they're broken, especially things like ducks. And so you just want to be careful uh, that you don't poke a hole in the skin when you're, when you do it this way. Or but, uh, yeah, or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, there's the break, obviously, the humor. And so I'm just... Oops. Cut through there, make sure not to cut that skin. Now I've got that wing separated from the body. I'm ready to start going up the, the neck here. Is it known why the color of Tessie's varies? No. no. Good question, we don't know. And some birds, you'll have one black and the other one will be tan colored, the same individual. So on ducks here, as I approach the head, um, big head, little neck. <laughs> okay, so you can't, you can't normally, you would go over the, over the um, head with the skin. Uh, on ducks, we don't do that. Anything, uh, woodpeckers, uh, the bigger woodpeckers, like uh, ivory builds, you wouldn't do that. So next time you get a chance to skin an ivory build. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and cut that off. I get as close as I can. I can actually feel the skull right there. Uh, so get as close as I can. I'm just going to snip off the neck there. Downside of having to do this, and the one of the downsides of doing Mark's method is that if you do want to save a partial skeleton, you're cutting through the, the neck and you're ruining that, that vertebra there. Is it possible to disarticulate spine? Sure. Mm. Sort of, yeah. Do you want to support prep number on this as far as the tissue? There's a lot of... Uh, just do it your way. Yeah, do, put, put your prep number. 
Okay. So I've gone ahead, I've gone ahead and pulled out the tissue. If we were in a field camp right now, and we had liquid nitrogen, I would immediately drop this into the liquid nitrogen tank. Now, if we're in a place where we couldn't get liquid nitrogen, when we were working in countries where it is difficult, I'd take a much smaller sample, and would probably only be muscle, and have a little sliver of tissue, sorry, a little sliver of tissue, and we would drop it in into this and make sure that the ethanol that we'd be using would wrap completely around, okay, what we do, what we get out of those two. So we should, we should freeze. Okay, go ahead and do that. So we would ensure that that tissue is in, in totally immersed with ethanol so it's preserved. And we might just keep that in a cryo box. Um, ideally, here we would go and put this in the freezer. Freezer. Freezer, okay. Negative 80, of course. Yes. So I'll just do um, ethanol, just muscle tissue and ethanol on this one. Okay. Uh, and so what I... Uh, a lot of times people carry around like little sheets of tin foil or something and so that each you know tissue sample is not going to be uh, contaminated with another one. I actually prefer just to go ahead and leave all the muscle right there and, and just use the, the uh, and chop it up a little bit and use the, the sternum of there of the bird to, as my little uh, sampling table. And so I just go ahead and chop it up a little bit inside the bird and then I just take that, that little bit out and I'll put it in the tissue too. Uh, again, if I was doing, you know, frozen, I wouldn't have to worry about this. I'd just take whatever if I want and put it in the tube. But, but anytime you're using the, uh, an alcohol or buffer, you would want to do it this way. Although we're learning now that buffer is not right. uh, we've, recommended. Right. We have found out from various people that had their samples in buffer for a long time that the buffers digested the entire sample. Uh, what did it define the word buffer? And well, there's various buffers, and I think it was. Oh, yeah, like so the ETA buffers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Is there a reason why you would just stick with ethanol all the time rather than worrying about uh, the liquid nitrogen if you're. Uh, well, yeah. the liquid nitrogen, you can take more tissue and take different kinds of it. Well, when we end up with ethanol, we're usually taking just pectoralis muscle, and that's it. So we're limiting us in the future, as Kim pointed out. We really can't predict how some of these samples might be used, so it's better let's have liver, let's have heart muscle, let's have pectoralis, if at all possible. So the ideal situation is freezing things right away. Um, so that's that's the ideal situation. But these remote camps, um, we're going to be going in Peru here in a couple of weeks, so we're going to go to a, we're going to be hiking over 4,000 meters, and there's no way to drive up to this site. So we're going to be putting a 10-liter liquid nitrogen tank in a backpack and carrying that up the mountain with us so we can get these fresh tissues versus it'd be easier for us to do alcohol but because of that we can get so much more out of this and Matt jump in and help us out here if you want to explain what what kinds of things we can get from a fresh tissue versus something in the ethanol because we, we do compromise things by throwing in ethanol. Yeah, that, I mean there's a couple things. One is as Mark alluded to and uh, that was an important part in the talk too is that we have no way of knowing what these things may be used for in the future. And for that reason, if you can freeze things as fast as possible, that gives you the, the widest range of possible future uses. There also, although hiking you know, up into the Andes during the liquid nitrogen tank is difficult, there are also some difficulties associated with ethanol. Most museum ornithologists can tell you horror stories where a little bit of ethanol leaked out of the tube and started to, if not completely, rub off the label on the tube. Um, and so one thing that you might want to mention, particularly in the field, if you are using ethanol, is a lot of people now are scratching right. uh, like diamond one number, you know, yeah. It's a diamond tip. Diamond tip scribe right there. So so scratching at least like a tissue number or a pet number or some unique ID that you have to a catalog to prevent uh, if, if that does happen so you still can identify that, that tissue. What do you think of the merit of doing both frozen and um, an ethanol sample on the same trip in case the shipment gets stuck in customs? And I, I think if you're working in, in the tropics or almost in any field situation, yeah. Depends, on, should, on, that depends kind of, on where you're working, yeah. And in a lot of places, people do that as a matter of course too, because if you're working in a lot of foreign countries, you might leave a tissue sample there and bring some back, and it's good to 
have those duplicates already ready to go, so you don't have to spend time on subsampling when you're, you know, finishing up your trip. So it's it's great to have those backups. And a lot of places too, um, a lot of places you might leave tissues in foreign countries, LSU has had this experience a lot, they might not have completely reliable liquid nitrogen resources, so right. or you know, they may have a minus 20, but we really like it at minus 80, and so having that ethanol backup, at least it's not temperature dependent, you know, it would still be. Or if someone forgets to fill the tank up after about. Oh, never. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, so, so this is actually young male, so I'm just going to. Okay, go for it. So, yeah. Point that out. There's, 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 there's two testes there. Anybody see that? Uh, like like maybe I'll just like let me open this up a little bit better. It just <laughs> While we're doing the adjustments, we're going to take a slight break when all the bodies are out and show some other techniques. Okay. And then that will give us time to clean up before you see there. The <laughs> head. So I, I've got this head partially inverted. Shall we better? Okay. You should keep going. Okay, I'll, I'll and wait. Then we'll take a break okay. once both the birds are totally skinned out. Okay. Anybody see those? Okay. So right now, I'm in the process. Okay, let's, let's sort of summarize what we've done so far. We've spent all this time removing the body. So we still have to clean the legs, the wings, and of course the cranium. So I've been working on inverting this head. And you have to take this kind of slow. And Chris is going to show you a more difficult case in this where the neck is uh, very thin and the head is huge. But on this bird, it's pretty standard. And as she showed on the, the website, I'm pulling the ear out. I'm using my finger nails to pull out where the skin is attached in the ear lobe area. And now I've got the eye isolated. But I'm going to go ahead and do, so I have this symmetrically, and I don't stress one side over there. I'm going to pull out the other place where the ear has been anchored. It's hard to see this bird's real bloody in the head, so I can't really point out where this orifice, where this came out of. But what I'm trying to do here is expose those eyes. And the trick here is when you remove the eyes, there's a membrane there holding the eyeball in. And what I want to do is trim right along the edge of the cranium, not puncturing that eyeball. And this takes practice. You know, your first couple of times you may end up breaking that eyeball, this, don't worry about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a dull probe, not uh, one with the point, and I'm going to rotate with the pressure of this probe on the cranium, and I'm trying to sever an optic nerve back there. And that white thing right there is the optic nerve. And now I'm going to have gravity help me here a little bit. I'm going to grab that optic nerve, and I'm going to try to trim right along the edge of where this membrane attaches to where the eyelid is, like that. And you can see now that I've removed that eye without puncturing it, fortunately. Yeah, <laughs> you don't want, it tastes kind of salty. <laughs> you squirt it in your mouth. Yeah. So you want to avoid that. Never had that happen, right? And it hurts your eye if it gets So same thing on the other side, I'm gonna do this real quick, just to demonstrate that one more time. I'm cutting right along the edge of the cranium Cutting that membrane like that, and then I'm going to use that dull probe, go in the back, I'm going to rotate with the pressure on the cranium. There's that, that white thing right there, or it's kind of pink, is the optic nerve. Pull that out, and then I'm going to trim right along the edge. So go ahead, Chris, if you Are want. we going to stop now, or do you want to? No, no, what, what I'm thinking is you finish your head, head. you're okay. going to do the uh, cut. So yeah, so what I've got here is the, the back of this duck head. Um, I'm just parting the, the feathers here a little bit. And I'm gonna, um, I cut it off basically right there at the base of the skull. And so I just need to make an incision so that I can get access to, uh, to the eyes and the brain and everything. So I'm just making a... <laughs> Sorry about that, gang. <laughs> Just making a little incision on the back here. That was, that was Oreo cookie. <laughs> um, and you're bound to lose a couple of feathers when you're doing that, but not too much. And so now I'm just going to peel that 
over the head and get to where I can get access to the ears and the eye. So the first thing we come to, of course, is the ear. You kind of pinch that. Pinch, pinch and pull, pinch and twist, basically. Sort of a roll like that. Uh, with you know, the bigger the bird gets, the harder it is to pull it out without tearing it a little bit. But as long as you tear it just a little bit and not too much, you're you're, you're okay. I noticed it was a short fingernails. Is that for a reason? Um, well, I actually grow my fingernails longer for an expedition. I, I grow, I like to keep my thumb fingernails kind of long yeah. and uh, keep them in shape. <laughs> you know, I used to be able to do beer cans on top of them. <laughs> yeah, when that one expedition. Back in the day. Yeah, back in the day when you had your pink fingernails. Yeah. <laughs> so, should I go ahead and show how to do the back? Cutting the back out where you're uh, Sure, yeah. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to cut to the back. Of the cream, or we're going to remove the brain case here. And basically, it's a rectangle. I'm going to cut just inside the jaw, up on one side and the other. Remember, we've removed the eyeballs first because if I was doing this incision right now with those eyes still in there, I might, scissors might puncture those eyeballs and I'd have eye fluid everywhere. So I've cut out the back. Let me turn this around so you guys can see it. We've cut up, across, and on the side. And now we've got to clean out the cranium. And I'm just going to sit here and for a minute or so cleaning that out. And I'll be trimming the jaws. There's a lot of jaw muscles there. And if you get a woodpecker, there's an immense amount of uh, muscle in there. Parrots. Parrots. Parrots are the worst. They are the worst. What's that? The blinker method, we actually removed the, most of the skull. Just uh, and the eyes and the only the right. We're, we're going to do that with the Taraco. Okay. Makes this part a lot easier. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to trim this a little bit more. I think doing that so that I use gravity, I can usually get a meninges and kind of pull it out one block. If it's fresh, a fresh bird really can pull the whole brain out at one time, but when these things have been sitting in the freezer, they're kind of mushy. Oh. I start that cut by um, putting the scissors through yeah. down here, and then I make sure the two bones are here that they're cut, and often the whole brain comes out on the uh, neck, and it's totally clean in there, which is nothing. I do this while Mark's cleaning his brains out. I have a brain. I do the, uh, my eyes just a little bit differently than, than, than Mark does. Uh, so here's, I, I've already done this one side, but um, as I've done, pick up past the ear and gotten to the eye, I just, I pull on that skin a little bit and it kind of shows you uh, a little slight different color where where the, uh, the the difference between the eye and the skin just right there. If you kind of pull and just gently scrape as you're pulling, you will all of a sudden realize that you've gotten the eye and the eye ring separated. Before pulling the eye out, I go ahead and do all that. The reason we're so careful around this eye area is because oh, things like flycatchers have eye rings and so forth, and so having that full part of the face often helps in IDs. Some eye, uh, flycatchers, like in Pinnex flycatchers, have a complete eye ring. Some have a broken eye ring. So it's, it's nice to be able to preserve that, those facial characteristics. And so what I do is I just take uh, my curved forceps here, my trusty cur curved forceps, and I just work my way around behind the eye and just pop it. Out. I was curious, when you go to the field, how many uh, actual tools do you keep in your kit? Do you have several pairs of forceps? One, yeah, usually one pair of forceps, but then a couple size scissors, because we don't like the doll or these iris scissors. We're using those just for the iris. And then heavier scissors. You've probably seen me use three different pairs of scissors on this bird. And for those heavy legs, I use a heavy pair of scissors because you don't dull them. Yeah, I mean, I've got like my favorites, like these little forceps here I've had with for like 15 years, and they're all bent, and, you know, but, but I still love them. <laughs> uh, and so in this other, this other little weird pair of scissors here, I use this pair a lot too. And the golden rule of camp is you don't sit down at someone else's prep site and start using their 
utensils. So. <laughs> you can lose your manhood if you're a man. <laughs> uh, well, I, I have worried about losing my manhood, but I have a pair of virus scissors, scissors from Fine Science Tools. They're about 72 bucks, and they have a little saw serration on them. And if any of the students comes in the lab and cuts a bone with it, mm -hmm. they're done. <laughs> Well, anyway, so yeah, in terms of tools, um, again, the um, I really like these um, large um, bent. You know, I love these things, but I know a lot of people like straight. Yeah. You know, so it's 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 very particular. Some people like to use razor blades, um, you know, with the safety saw, and some people like scalpels. It, it's all over the map. So I guess the camera was on me there. You saw me just pull the tongue out. And now I've got my eyes and my tongue and everything out. And I just need to um, take off the back of the skull. And I, I tend to do this with a, uh, a scalpel blade. A lot of people like to cut or do other methods. But, but I like to just go ahead and open this up with a, my scalpel. I try to leave the shape, the general shape of the skull, and just cut off just a little bit off the back. Go ahead and finish it off with the Yeah, no, I've never seen them. Then you can't have them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I can't remember if Mark, you do it this way. You've got a good cotton <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do three basic cuts to get all the brains and everything out. Um, one on each side of the, the jaw bones there. And then the last cut going across this way. It just pops everything out. Took out most everything. I'm going to be screaming fat for the next hour, so go me. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm just finishing up cleaning up here. Did you want to now get time to do something? Because uh, well, I'm going to be cleaning I'm muscle trying to, and, and I'm trying brains. to get rid of the fatty grass from Mark. Oh, it's okay. A lovely, it's under control. Not fatty great horde owl to finish but, up or something else. But this is what. Well, no, but this is a real way. thing where you know in camp you may have a bird where you're sitting there lily scraping for 30 minutes, and I'm one of the things I'm doing here is I'm opening up those feather tracks, and it's the fat scrapes out pretty easily, and notice how I'm scraping away from the edge of the feathers because I don't want to scrape towards those feathers because the fat will go right on those feathers. And oftentimes when I'm doing this to ensure my fingers aren't greasy, I just line those feathers with whatever substance you're using and so my fingers touching that not with greasy fingers. And so that cornmeal is protecting those feathers as I scrape this fat. And this is not bad compared to some birds. Fall migrants, uh, some of these warblers or vireos that will be coming through here in the next month, you literally, you can open them up and barely touch the breast and the skin will pop open. They're so extended from fat, it's amazing. I'm going to uh, put these close to your tray. This obviously... Is yeah, this a bear trap? Or? <laughs> on a swan, it's not bad. <laughs> Swans are also bad. And on some people like these. Right. I don't know whether you use these. And what, what we're showing here is a grapefruit spoon, uh, spoon, and this is actually more for mammal preps, but for some of the larger birds, it it works like a hot down. Like a gull or something. Yeah. Yeah, so I have, we have, have, we have fat shots. wheels. And, yeah, uh, we do, yeah. And so we, we so use those use lot, this. but uh, we do have some of those tools lying around. So I'm, yeah, and also, this is a, a duck when I'm that. scraping, I'm scraping with the direction of the feather, not against it, because that you'll end up ruining the skin. So this is actually pretty handy. I'm, I'm breaking up those feather tracks and scraping that and, and go to this scalpel real quick and clean that. And I'll throw a little cornmeal on here because I've got other things to do. That cornmeal will be absorbing some of that fat that's sitting on the on the skin while I do some other things. Do I use okay. we, our philosophy with regard to any chemicals is we try not to introduce any chemicals whatsoever. Like for storage in our place, we if you don't have an insect, a severe insect problem, we tend not to use um, paradichloroamine or, uh, or 
we, we tend not to for, for decreasing yeah, on scans. We tend to uh, open up all the feather tracks, wash with Dawn uh, repeatedly if necessary uh, until you get all that fat out. Wish we had a, we should have taken some pictures yeah, of some pictures. specimens out yeah, because they would come yellow. I mean, literally, and they'll then as time and dust gets on them, they become matted down, and and they can compromise the rest of your collection because when bugs infest your collection, they're going to go for where those fat birds are, and they go through several generations before you might discover that they're in your cabinet. So there is a beetle called the grease beetle that is attracted to to that kind of stuff, and. Um, we had a, our, our mammal division had a massive grease beetle outbreak. And uh, they, oh, those, awesome. those beetles were able to get in and out of the brand new nice cases that were supposed to be completely yeah. seen. And, uh, and, we, we, and our birds happened to be right next to the mammals. And we found that uh, those beetles were finding their way into all of our swamp cases and things that tend to be greasy. They weren't in any of the passer cases, but they were going into those cases. Somehow the beetles were able to know that those cases had greasy things inside. So um, so there are definitely pest management reasons for, for wanting to do it. Uh, aesthetic reasons, you know, your the grease leaches out onto your paper and your trays and you know, there's there's there are a number of reasons for wanting to uh, get things as degreases. It's oily and it's oily and moist shortly after preparation. And so when it's in that stage you can So what I'm doing, there's this bone that's thicker. There's two bones in here that are one's thin, one's that's the radius, and there's a thicker one called the ulna. And the secondaries are attached at the base of the ulna. So I'm using my fingertip to pull those secondaries away from the ulna. You can see I've got quite a bit of uh, flight muscle here. So I'm going to cut some of these tendons and muscle, and I'm going to cut the radius, the smaller the bone that sits on top of the ulna. And I'll pull it back. It's kind of greasy. So I've been spending the last few minutes working on degreasing this bird. And I'm going to show you a couple of tricks I did. I was constantly, I don't know if you were watching me time to time, I was taking cornmeal and just running my fingers through it so I wouldn't get that grease on these feathers. And I'm having to do that here because this is so greasy. So here's the ulna. And in fact, we can probably see some of these notches. There's right there and there's another where those secondaries were attached. And now I'm going to look for a bigger pair of scissors and cut that about two-thirds of the way out, three-quarters of the way out, trim some of the tendons in here. So now I've got both wings clean. I went ahead and did the other. And you have a couple options what you can do here. Now, if I had all these bones broken, I would sew from the base of the feather track to the other one. But I'm going to go ahead and try to tie this on here just to show you that method. I think, Chris, you're going to show how to tie yeah, I'll show a, a, a modification. So I have got this wet. And the reason I've wetted this string is it'll stay on that bone and cinch down much tighter. So we don't want it to slip off. So here I am just tying a knot. And probably this one of the single most difficult things to teach someone their first couple of scans is how far apart do you tie the wings. And as a rough estimation of that, you can use the, now I actually toss the body, but that approximation of how the wings were when the bird, when the body was in there, is a gauge for how far to tie these apart. So here I'm putting the other loop on the other wing, the base of the ulna. And I have about that far apart. So, there, so I've tied the wings together, and if these were much bigger bones, I would wrap cotton around those so they wouldn't puncture the skin. And so real quickly, you can grab cotton and wrap it around those tips of those feathers so they won't puncture through the skin. And the same thing for the tarsus. I've got the, I'm going to just show you one of these where I've got the tarsus down here. I'm just going to wrap a little cotton around there. And also, this keeps 
keep this leg from being pulled out to the body. So if someone's measuring the tarsus on this by having this inside the body, when I'm going to reverse this like this, it's sitting in here and it's less easier to pull that leg out and have it detached from the skin, which you don't want to do. So Chris, you want to go ahead to Chris and show? Yeah, so I was just going to show a um, slightly different method of doing that. I've already done one of these here. Uh, but we always, uh, Roxy Laybourne, who was at our museum for 60 years or something like that, she was always very adamant about not stripping those secondaries off of the bone. Uh, and so she was very, very proud to say that we don't do that this Smithsonian. Um, Alan Phillips would have been happy. Yeah. When I first got there, that's how I had learned to do it. So that's the way I was doing it. Uh, and I have since switched over so that, uh, so that I leave those secondaries attached to the ulna and leave the radius and ulna all together and still attached. And so the way I do that, it takes a little bit longer to do it this way. Uh, but I feel like it, it gives you a, a sturdier skin. Uh, it helps make sure that your feathers uh, your secondaries especially stay together and in place. Um, How is measuring? Are they easier or harder to measure? It's, I think it's a more accurate measure. Definitely more this way, measure. For sure. And there's, you're doing, there's another reason not to strip the secondaries in some birds like cuckoos. Right. The secondaries just drop off. So you have to know what kind of bird you're dealing with. If you do strip secondaries, you've got, there's some species you just don't do it for. The cuckoos is a good example. So, uh, and the way I do that, to clean this out then without, you know, stripping it up, of course, a lot easier, but uh, here if I just uh, cut those tendons and uh, one end here at the, uh, the bone. Go ahead and cut all of them. There's one that's always hidden down here. That one, you can hear the pop. Let me get that one. And then put a little bit of dust, gives you a little bit of grip. And then you just grab those muscles and Peel them back. On a larger bird, would you just cut from the outside and take the muscle out? Yeah. So uh, I talked a little bit about a slightly different method from what Mark was doing with these uh, wings. And the way I tie them is a little different as well. Uh, so I have all my bones still in here. And I, what I did was I took uh, my needle and thread and I actually sewed underneath the ulna down there. And I've already tied off this one side and brought that string over and again underneath the ulna. And now I'm ready to just tie that off. Uh, and we threw away our, our bodies there again. But the distance is uh, about the, the width of, of the humeri from where, the, where I broke them off. Uh, and so in this duck, probably right about right around there, fairly narrow. Do you want uh, the body back? No, that's fine. But I mean, yeah, so this, this distance is what we're looking at right there. Right, the distance between the scapulas. Yeah, basically. Right. Yeah. So, um, so that's about what I've done with this. And if it's too loose, you can have a weak specimen. Right. And if it's too tight, you can have a hard time. When the wings will sort of stick out. I prefer too tight over too loose. Right. Uh, but and so I, I tend to do it a little tighter. But if you get to where you've already stuffed the bird and they are too loose, you can pin them and that will help to dry that way even though they won't be really secure. But it will help a lot. And so now that those are tied, to go ahead and just pull out these wings and get that bone. The way I do that is I grab a hold of the primaries and, and right down here and just kind of pull that out and turn it and twist it and it, and it gets that bone back into place. Everybody's back in place. This bird, of course, had a little problem with its wing, so we'll ignore that side. But uh, but that's it for the wings. I think Mark's going to go to the eye. Yeah. So I've been working on getting this thing de-soiled from all the grease, and you can see by putting cornmeal in there, I've kept it pretty uh, grease-free. And I've already put one of the eyes in. Basically, just roll into a little ball. And we grab it with the base at the base of that ball of forceps. And recall that we, when we opened up the back of the cranium, we opened up the eye socket. So I'm coming in through the neck and going into the back of the skull, coming in like this into the eye socket, like that. 
and now I've got both eyes in. And I look at those, just make them symmetrical. And I've gone ahead and pre-sharpened this dowel. The point is up at this end, so I'm going to take the non-pointed end and go in like that, so I'm not piercing that skin. And I'm going to put that point up into a groove in the maxilla, the upper mandible. Now there's an alternative to this. If I was doing like a pig meow, I would probably do a ball on the end of that stick and stick that ball up there and I'd have it big enough so that when it went into that cranium it would fill up that whole brain cavity. A ball of cotton. A ball of cotton, excuse me, a ball of cotton. Like a lollipop. Yeah, like a lollipop. I, I should have made one and show you that. I'll, well, if we're doing something else, I'll make one of those. Now, well, another choice I have here, another option is, okay, this has got a little top knot on it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to preserve that top knot because if we classically put the, the steady skin on its back, but that top knot gets flattened down. On birds with uh, crests and top knots like this, you can turn the head sideways like that so the specimen will maintain that particular structure. Now, another option, um, and the classic method would be to wrap the cotton body around that stick. But when I got retrained at LSU, I learned the way of uh, wrapping around the stick. Well, if you make a mistake, then you have to start all over. The quick and dirty way of doing this is make a cone. While we were talking, I made a cone in this, and I'm going to slide that. I'm going to break the stick off inside the body cavity. And now I'm going to slide that cone using my forceps up that stick into where I can grab it through the mouth. Like that here comes out of the mouth. And the beauty of this method is if I got too much cotton in here, I can always just pull it off. So I'm going to start just stuffing this cotton in there. And again, if I got too much in the end, I can just pull off. It's pretty good cotton. I like this cotton here. So now I get this long strand cotton so it stays together. My stick is turned sideways here. Do you have to use a organic cotton? Uh, we'd like to use this Red Cross, but they quit making it. Because <laughs> it's, it's this really long strand stuff that you can't buy any longer. It's been, what, 10 years since we've been able to buy, roughly 10 years. The okay, synthetic stuff is hard. Inject. Okay, some people, and I've got these, which I forgot to tell you about. Some people like what's made in South America better. Okay, and then there's this, this is which is basically upholstery, um, uh, what they use at the work. So basically, I think that when it comes to choosing your cotton, it's like, um, um, you know, what desk and everything, everyone has their definite opinions on what Depends what kind of body you're going to make. If you're going to make a cotton body like that, you want something that's very springy, kind of springs out and fills it. Whether, if you're making a wrap body on the stick, Go for it. Yeah. Is there like an archival reason why you would want to use synthetic cotton? Synthetic cotton doesn't, it doesn't, uh, can't tear it and do it in the same way. It's, and I don't know about the archival part. Mm -hmm. I, I would worry about, like Mark was saying, in general, we try and stay away from anything chemical. So anything synthetic, uh, it's a polyester, it's a what, petroleum product probably. We would stay away from it for that reason. We don't know what it's Whereas with these more natural products, we have a little bit of confidence that they're going to have more staying power uh, and not off gas or trace chemicals. That is the archival reason, but then there's just the mechanical reasons, and that the synthetic stuff is so impossible yeah. to work with. Uh, it's just it's just crazy. What we do for really big birds, like if you're doing a goose, we'll take that polyester type of stuff, have that build the most of the body, and then we wrap it with cotton on the outside of it. So what's touching the actual skin is cotton. But you haven't wasted a whole roll of cotton. Yeah. Yeah. We'll use like sort of the uh, the natural the natural cotton that you were showing there as our core, and then we use the nice pharmaceutical rolled stuff for the external parts. Right. right. I've seen people use all kinds of things to, just to fill space in a big room. Yeah. Right. Uh, so do, you, do you use this type of stuff ever? Um, for the inside of a bigger bird. Yeah. So I'll just show what that looks like. Yeah. That looks nice. So, 
some of you mentioned not using any chemical things. So if you were to use, say, mineral spirits to be grease or synthetic cotton, should that be noted somewhere? Absolutely. Very good yeah. point. Okay. Yeah, we do. I mean, we for our skeletons that are greasy, we, we use um, some sort of, uh, we used to use regular old gasoline from a pump. Uh, and, and we've stopped doing that. We switched to, uh, for a while to hexanes, which is a, just sort of real purified type of gasoline, and then uh, that became too expensive, and so we're looking for another option. But our, we have a lot of people that use our skeleton collection, our curators that uh, want nice, clean skeletons, and so they told us to do whatever they have to do. And, and the philosophy we use is we don't use anything. If they have grease on them, so be it. Yeah. So that that actually should be noted, though, like say. Yes. Skin yeah. preparation. Right. Mineral spirit right. here in some cases is used to uh, decrease that. Right. So we do we do definitely note that. Um, and we you know we haven't noticed any problems, you know, we've been we've been using um, uh, petroleum chemicals like that for I don't know, thirty years or something. We have skeletons. So but, but I think wouldn't you agree that even if you just Wash a bird with water, and that should be noted too. Um, well, soap and water, yes. I, I, soap and water, yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely. 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 So, you know, you, you should know whether you washed a bird. And on, on our particular data sheets, um, if you haven't written anything, it's assumed you just use water and dawn. And if you've used, um, you've got paper, then you've got to note that as well. Okay. And um, the um, people that are interested in ectoparasites are also very interested to know. They don't want to look at the skin that's been washed. Right, right. So Chris, you want to go ahead and you? Yeah, so I just, I just sort of finished. I, I didn't really talk my way through it, but it was on the camera, up on the screen, so you probably saw I just stood up the back of the head on this, so, on this bubble head. And it's ready to go now again. And some birds, you don't have to do that. Like in long crested woodpeckers, I don't even sew it close. Oh, really? I just pinch it and it dries that way. Uh, so, go ahead. So, you saw that cone I had, really sloppy looking, fits inside the body. I took a little excess out, and now I'm ready to uh, sew this up. And I'm going to start right there where the furcula was. Get my forceps out of the way. And one of the keys of sewing things up is not doing a cross hatching where you go to one side and then we go directly across to the other side and that's how you, you march down the whole bird by going I'm on one side I'm going to that same side again taking another stitch and I'm being careful not to pull in feathers when I do that so I'm going right the edge of the skin because once you get you know a couple of millimeters in and you start pulling feathers in, you're going to have feathers that are twisted, and you'll, whatever you do, you'll never get them straight. So again, I'm, I've got two stitches on one side, I'm going directly across to the other side, taking a stitch there. I'm going to go to the same side, further down. And notice how loose I am. I'm not getting in this real tight. It's not like these are you know, even a few millimeters apart or even a half a centimeter apart. I'm moving down an inch or two on each side. I'm sort of pulling this as I go just to make sure that I don't get anything bundled up. And I'm going to take this last stitch on the side of the body down here and I'm going to direct it across and then I'm going to go down to the vent next. At this point, I'll use my forceps and sort of tuck things in. Let me open this up so you can see what's going on. Is that showing up? And then I'm going to pull this tight just to see how the body's coming together. And I've got this a little of kilter just because I'm trying to preserve that top knot on this. See, I've got the head kind of turned sideways. And the hardest birds are to line are those ones like this that have these uh, ventral scaling or to get them to line up. I'm just pulling on that and you can see it's coming together. And I'm going to anchor that tail. And there's a little meat that we had down by where the uropygial gland was. There's a little meat there. And I'm going to go down and take that last stitch. 
in there to just pull that tail region up so that it's not flopping. And here's the uh, coical opening right through that fleshy part of the coical opening. Let me see if I can expose that. Can you see the opening there now? That there, like that. I'm going to go right through that. That's my last stitch. And that fleshy part will, but it usually won't pull out on you. And that's basically it. And then what I'm going to do is after that, I'm going to tie the legs together. I'm going to cross the legs with a different uh, string, a heavier string. We always use a, a thicker th uh, thread for the legs. And then I'm going to pull the wings together. And then I'll tie the bill shut. And then we'll pin this bird on a board. And you can see I've preserved the top knot. The next a little uh, twisted. But you can see we've, we've got everything more or less lined up. And I'll pin this wing closed. But in a, just real in a nutshell. Okay. But I thought I'd just show that real quickly without doing every little bit of it. Well, Chris, was there something else you wanted to show at this point? Or should I go ahead? Um, I was just, yeah, so I can get going here I was just going to show a slightly different methodology here uh, and I, I only do this for ducks uh, typically I do basically what Mark had done and put a stick in it and put the cotton in and grab a hole with the cotton through the mouth uh, with ducks uh, I, I tend to make a little bit of a neck on the stick first and then put that in uh, I just find again the whole concept of this you know big body and a little tiny neck I, I just figure it's easier to um, to go ahead and make the neck first and then put the cotton in for the body later. Is there a reason why you don't put forceps in to kind of guide to stick up through this part? Uh, no, I just kind of do it by feel. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there's the there's the stick coming out. And so I just gonna the same kind of method, I just grab a hold of the stick right. instead of cotton and then just and then just slowly pull that the neck down. Uh, the trick here is you don't want to, you know, with ducks you don't want a, a long neck. It's a, a real easy, there's a tendency to make long necked ducks. Long necked all birds. Yeah, all birds. Yeah, right. yeah. And so with, with so I, I, I can really just be real careful not to pull on it too far. So that's probably about all I'll do with that. And then the other thing I do, uh, sorry. Uh, cut the stick off and I'm going to put the, the other end of the stick through the cloaca. And that gives me a nice straight body. So I'll have, the, I do the same method as Mark where I put the, the, the tip of the stick, can you see? Okay, uh, right up into the palate there. Kind of push forward until the a little bit of a crunch and that now gives me a nice straight body with the tip of the bill straight all the way down to the tail uh, having that stick through the cloaca and the bill like that gives you a nice straight bird now if chris had a long leg bird like a black neck stilt or american avocet he might have that stick come out of the cloaca and extend several inches or centimeters beyond that and then you can anchor those legs on that so they'll be secure otherwise uh, any bird that has really long legs or thick legs those things will flop yeah yeah I, uh, most birds i like to keep the stick hidden but uh, a long leg bird is definitely um, so again you know now that i again this is only something i do with ducks but uh, but since i already have a neck uh, i just need to make a, a body for this and so i don't really do the cone thing. Uh, I did put a little bit of cotton, you can see inside there, I did put a little bit of cotton underneath my string, just tying the wings, and that helps fill the back out. Uh, so I have that in there, and I put a little bit of cotton around the stick uh, just to help keep the cotton from shifting on the stick. Sometimes it slides off to one side or the other and gives you a lopsided bird. Looks like you put a little out of leg there too. Yeah, so the legs, I think, so the both legs have cotton, I think Mark said that. Uh, earlier, we have both both legs have been wrapped with cotton to to, to make up for what we took out. Uh, and now I'm just going to uh, take some of my cotton, kind of roll it up, and, and put it on the inside.
and oftentimes um, birds that have uh, big wings and a rounded back, I, underneath that cotton stick, I will put a layer of cotton there to give it that rounded appearance. That otherwise, that sinks there oftentimes on you. So it literally would put a swath of cotton underneath the stick and then put this ball or that bit, what he's got right there on top of it. Yeah. And then you get a nice rounded full body bird that way. Yeah, so that's what I have here. I have a little bit of cotton down there. And uh, I'm just going to put these pieces in here, uh, one on each side of that stick to fill in this body. And with ducks, there, there is definitely a tendency to make them too high. Uh, and they yeah, and, uh, and so we want to, I'm going to try to keep these as flat as I can, so I actually have sort of a flat piece of cotton. I'll put one of these on each side of this. And that's because we can get more specimens in a cabinet. Yeah, exactly. So, other than getting more specimens in a cabinet, do you have feelings about understuffing or overstuffing in terms of getting a better bird? Well, one of the things that's unsaid in all this is the better your specimen looks, the better it will be handled by people down the road. So that will increase the longevity of it. When you see a really nice specimen, all of us tend to are biased there, and we handle it more carefully than a really poorly made skin. So it's the opposite of that is when there's a really nice one, everybody wants to use it as their show and tell. That's true. Is that why we've so ever used one of yours? <laughs> It's so, true, it's true. So you can kind of see. What do you think people value more aesthetically? What bird look like where you started? Just try to adjust it to that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's another thing I do when I'm teaching people. Like, I go pick a really nice one out of the collection, and I bring it in and say, here, make it look like that. <laughs> and then, you know, helps them envision what they're trying to, to obtain. It's something else that occasionally we do is you can either measure it or you can just use a pencil but on a piece of paper take your bird and uh, before you even cut it basically draw the outline or marks and then before you get to this pinning stage compare that and then you'll discover that the neck is twice as long as uh, if you're a student so you can either take the measurements or do sort of a little drawing and then make sure that the bird's the same size. I thought it would be helpful for the, seeing where the wing tips come down to uh, in the whole bird. Uh, Primary for so it's not really necessary to use a lot of stitches, um, just enough to get it closed up. Feathers cover up a lot. Do you do the square Yeah, so I do, just like Mark had described. Um, Tristan, is it Tristan? Yeah. Tristan Davis came from that. Uh, and so I lost my. Uh, so yeah, I start at the top. Some a lot of people start at the the bottom at the cloaca and work their way up. So, uh, we have quite a few people that do it that way. Um, but I, I like to go from the top down. And so go ahead and pull on that. Looks good. And you have a, you often get this line down the middle uh, with ducks. And so one of the ways of getting rid of that, I find, is, is just to take my thumb and kind of work massage those feathers a little bit, and you can actually get rid of that, that line. Sometimes. <laughs> Not all the time. Not all the time. But most of the time, you can actually get it to the point where you can't see that anymore. It's like I'm I did an ancient merlin that got lost, it was found on, on one of the uh, uh, inland lakes, and I did the side cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting is I ended up with a central line. <laughs> there was no cut there, and one can argue that I didn't stop it enough. But uh, there is, uh, in some birds, there's a, there's a, there's some ducks, there's a, just a very slight area that doesn't have many feathers, and that will um, make the so I've, I've pinned this bird while we've been talking. One of the things I've done is I've spread the feathers, or the tail feathers out a little bit, about the width of the body. And I've done that before. I pinned them. I just pulled each of the, the outer rectrices out a little bit to get those that nice spread. 
put a couple pins there. Also now I've had a tarsus move on me. What I'm gonna do is move a pin where I get a nice even spread, symmetrical spread with the feet. So it makes it easier to look at the scutellation on those feet as well as measure them. Let me do that. And then I put a pin in here to hold those uh, wing, the legs together. And then you can see I've, I've marched along there and put several pins along there to hold those wings in tight. And you can see the head, how it's been done. I've tied the bill closed. Sometimes it's better if you, get a, if, you, if you put a piece of paper and then use the pins, and then you don't get that kind of bed head. Right. Back or, or even cotton. Yeah. Do you spin the bill down to the there from the cross over the I, on, a, on a bill that's long, like an abacus or something like that, I'll pin all along that bill. But on this short, stubby bill, I don't you know, do that. So, and then the next thing, obviously, you do the most important thing of all is have a tag with all the data attached to the specimen. So, a specimen without data is basically worthless. So all these data they're recording all through this process will go on the tag, like we showed earlier, you know, one of these data-rich tags. And one of the things I tend to do to help me remember is I use the same format every tag I do. It helps me remember if I have a certain order, but I forgot a piece of data, I'll go back to this. It happens fairly frequently you forget those data. And so if you have a, a stereotype way of putting the data on the tag, it, it helps a lot. Yeah, something we're doing that you know not everybody agrees with, but we have computer-generated specimen labels. So we, we actually make the labels afterwards. We go back to the museum and enter all the data, uh, print off labels, and then attach them. So in the field, and in the prep lab, we're just using a small uh, skull tag, round tag, with the basic data, date, sex, weight, uh, genus, species, and prep number. The problem with doing it in the field, as several of our colleagues have found out the hard way, it had their boats sunken by people, and, and the catalogs were separated from the specimens, and all they had was whatever they had in that little tag, maybe just a sex symbol, not even the date, and they've all the data lost. They've been left in a taxi cab, taxi cab drive away with the catalogs, gone forever, or had them stolen. So. We highly recommend in a field camp that, our, at least well, our philosophy is, every bit of data goes on that tag and that tag, tag is attached to each specimen. You can't lose it that way. Yeah. Now it's another matter if you're in a lab. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I didn't necessarily agree with this, but <laughs> it was a decision we made at the Smithsonian. I also argue that even in a lab, Sometimes the data sheet goes astray right. if the information is not put on the bird as it's in. And you saw from those uh, images I had of that vervain hummingbird, the data I had in the front locality, coordinates, data collection, I had my prep number just as a cross reference, and then the back that the tag will have in its hefty size. Uh, the, the, this bird weighed 200 grams. The crop was and the uh, stomach were full of bird feed. There was no wing or tail molt, no body molt. Uh, there were no soft part colors associated with the specimen. It's probably found too long after death because we've had things like ant pittas where literally a few seconds after the bird died, the iris color will change. So it's important to record those data, hopefully when the bird is alive but certainly shortly after death, otherwise you lose accurate documentation. Some of these birds, the only way to tell them apart is iris color. They're that similar plumage morphology. You saw that they showed a, a great uh, a cover of, the, was that the auk that showed, was that Cytolopus styles eye? Was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but but those, I just saw that like a week ago. Yeah, he just saw that in Columbia a week ago. So those, those, all those cytolobes, those tapacoulas, all look the same. But some of them have a little difference in tarsus coloration and so forth. So having that information accurately is, is really important. So that, that's why I took a few seconds in my talk to talk about photographing it, preferably with a gray card. Now, I didn't show a gray card in there, but having those uh, coloration standardized with a gray card. Speaking of that, if you have an audio recording, typically put that on your tag then as well? Any, any, any oh, absolutely. Yeah. So when I record birds, oftentimes we go out and you're probably asking, well, how do you get these birds in a field camp? 
typically we go out in the morning and the thing I love more than anything is, is recording bird voices. And I'm often record, especially dawn songs, where you, you hear a bird singing pre-dawn and you don't know what it is. You see a silhouette, you've got a nice recording of it, you shoot it and you go, oh, that's an Elania flycatcher. You've got that associated with it. And you'll put on that tag right there in the field, record and maybe cut 31 of that day so that we eventually there'll be a, a ML catalog number from Macaulay Lab associated on that tag. Yeah. Photo taken, same thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, nowadays with digital photos, it's much easier to, to know, have your, your photos are sort of numbered on your camera. You can actually say this was number or whatever. Right. Much easier than the old film days. Right. Now we have sure. to wrap up. Yeah. Because um, we have to be out of here in <laughs> so I was just. Uh, I was, the audience has to help us get out. Oh, we can, we'll, we'll get this so you're, you're all hostage in here. We're going to lock the doors. So I was just proofing so, um, the training there, and I'm all done. Do you want to both do a summary? Do you want to do a summary? Well, uh, the, the one thing I would like to say is data, data, data. That's the single most important part of this whole process. You know, record the data as you go along, uh, ensuring that you've got it down accurately. Um, many of the things. We've done, you've heard there's, there's other options for almost every step of the way. What you should do is you know, learn from whoever's teaching you and realize that there are other options and try those other options because you may find that maybe better for you. But one thing you want to do is make sure whatever option you pick is one that's going to stabilize that specimen for those several thousand years. Okay? Don't shortchange it. Don't skip on cleaning the bird, saying, oh, that's, that's not that much fat. It's important you take care of it when you're preparing the specimen. Because you want that specimen to last for indefinitely. Yeah, definitely. Quality over quantity. You know, but if you can only prep five birds a day, doing it right, instead of you know, six or seven a day, taking shortcuts, prep five a day and, and go. I'd like you all to join me in thanking Mark Robbins from Kansas University. It's a pleasure. And uh, Chris Melinsky oh, from the Smithsonian for being our main preparators today. I'd also like to uh, thank Jonas Lang, uh, Wan Chi Yang, Stella Ramey, and um, Kim Boswick. Sorry, my ability to And so okay. you've added very good points, so thank you for doing that. And if you're ever at one of our institutions, we'd be willing to show you this process again. Just let us know. So we prep birds all the time. If you're in whether it's Washington, D.C., University of Kansas, or here in California, or in British Columbia, find out from people uh, if they're going to be doing some prepping. Stop by, and we'll show you how to do this. And fortunately, with some of this being will be online, you'll be able to access this. But Maybe that may not show everything, but don't hesitate to give us a ring or send us an email and ask us about something. Let's give them a hand.